Welcome to the First Cut Podcast. I'm Rick Gaiman, and this is your final round recap of the Safeway Open. And joining me to break it all down, it's Greg Ducharme. Greg, happy Sunday. Happy first Sunday of the season. Oh, by the way, happy week one of the NFL. Did you catch any football today? Uh, I, I caught a little bit. Not, not a whole lot, honestly. I, w- I wish I uh, had a chance to catch more. But um, yeah, interesting week in, in the fantasy football world. I don't know if, if you saw that. I had some. I, I thought I had a great team, and they perform really well. But it looks like I'm gonna. It looks like I'm gonna lose week one. So that's the uh, an added pain to my life. But uh, but the golf was great to watch today too. Yeah, I had I had a red zone on, and I, I, from what I understand, like every big name player scored like two touchdowns. So like yeah. everybody was just going nuts today, right? It, it was crazy. I mean, I, it was Devonte Adams that seems to have gotten me today. But then you had Adam <laughs> Thielen too. I, I mean, the team I went up against seems to have uh, they had quite a uh, quite a day, which I well, thought I did too. So hey, this is this is the uh, the world we live in. Luckily, only counts as one loss, Greg. Plenty of weeks to go. How about this? Uh, our best bets for the Safeway Open went three for three. So $100 wagers would have cashed in over 500. You can get that cheat sheet that we tweet out from at First Cut Pod on Twitter and Instagram. The one thing we didn't have, Greg, though, uh, Stuart Scott, Stuart Scott, who used to be the ESPN anchor, Stuart Sink, Stuart's. Oh, Stuart Sink wins the Safeway Open. Uh, did not see that coming. He goes out rounds of 67, 70, 65, and 65 to capture his seventh PGA Tour victory. Uh, we'll, we'll dive into some of the stats, but like your, your reaction, 11 years between victories here. So this is the – I feel like we, you and I have talked about this, Rick. I feel like with Stuart Sink, he, he's in that age where it's, it's no man's land. You're yeah. a little too you, you. There's such a big difference between what you can do and what the young twenty somethings can do. When you go and try to compete with a Matthew Wolf or uh, or or a Bryson, you know, a Justin Thomas, these guys maybe who are uh, they're they're not rookies, but they're maybe a little more polished. You start going up against them, and you feel like you're kind of on the other side. And it's almost it feels like as a viewer, it almost feels like you're just waiting for them to get to the PGA tour champions yep. uh, or so we thought because he played awesome today and it, it was, it was great to watch. He just, he stepped up and hit shots. The tee shots he was hitting were magnificent. Um, it, it was great to see because he was swinging really well and I've always enjoyed watching that swing. Yeah, this is interesting. This is kind of when <laughs> you're, you're and not for Stuart sink, obviously with this victory, but like you get whipped for like the last three years on the PGA tour. Then you get on the PGA tour champions and you're like the odds on favorite every single week. Like when Stuart sink turns 50, he's going to dominate the PGA tour champions and he's going to make a lot of noise. Uh, but here we go. 11 years between victories, reminiscent of what Ches Reeve did was that last year, the year before? He went 11 years between victories, which is just a testament to kind of what we talked about last night with Cameron Percy, uh, staying relevant, keeping your card, finding a way to get back in contention, and then when you do get back in contention, uh, closing it out. Like That's a, that's a pretty impressive feat to win twice uh, over an 11-year span, whether you won in between or not. You know, it, it's uh, interesting you say that. Because you think about Stuart Sink, and I'm watching him coming down the stretch, and my thought is, well, he's won before. I mean, he's won six times on the PGA Tour. This guy knows how to get the job done. Um, And he almost, in a funny way, has an advantage because it's clear that he's not at a distance disadvantage, right? When he Once he gets to the back nine, um, uh, my thought process is, well, he can still reach 16 and 18. So at this point, the age is, is just literally just a number. There's, yeah. there's no real disadvantage. It's not like there's a par five where you got to carry it over water and the rough's really thick. And no, you, you put the ball in the fairway, you hit good shots, you're going to have the same chances as everybody else. Um, so once it got to that point, it kind of, the tide kind of turned. And he was able to put the ball in the fairway a lot. Uh, um, very often he was hammered. I mean, 11 of 14 fairways on Sunday, which w- it was huge. 
Yeah, I was going to say, I don't think he missed one. I think he missed one on the back, one fairway on the back. So even when he had to step up there under pressure as he was, you know, uh, as it was becoming clear that he was in the lead and he was in contention, still did not wilt, uh, which you never know what's going to happen when you're, you know, 47 years old, 11 years between victories. Are you going to wilt on a Sunday? And what was really cool, Greg, he had his son on the back. Uh, which is which is spectacular, and there was so so much great audio because there was no fans out there. It was almost like Stuart Sink was talking Reagan, his son, through caddying. They were helping each other. Like the convo was was phenomenal. It, yeah, it was. It, it, which is, it's always a great story. But again, this speaks to that no man's land kind of territory. It's not very often you see a, a father and son um, <laughs> yeah. ca- caddying for one another and, and end up winning, especially when the when the father's playing. That's typically something you see when guys are on their way out and it's a celebratory walk or, you know, it's kind of in, in the twilight. And as you said, you're, you're showing them the ropes, give them an experience. Maybe they need a summer job or something. Uh, but but it's not often you see the the son on the bag for the eventual winner. So it, it was great to see and, and watching Stewart kind of talk his way through these shots. Reagan's a soundboard at that point, a, a sounding board. And I, I feel like Stewart really was able to, um, to talk his way through the shots and, and just get a little bit of confidence. But uh, ultimately, I mean, these were, these were Stewart's decisions and he was able to stick with them and make great swings down the stretch. Reagan better make sure the old man cuts him that 10% check. Yeah. For the, I, uh, I was uh, thinking about that payday for the kid. I love it. Um, Harry Higgs finished solo second here. And, you know, there was a couple of moments, you know, obviously goes out. He shoots the 62 in round two, which includes the albatross on his final hole. So we've been talking about him all weekend. Um, it, we talk a lot, Greg, about, margins and what the margins are from the corn fairy to the PGA from keeping your card from player 100 to player 70 even smaller for Harry Higgs who gets on to 16 T after making bogey on 15 and he hits a ball dangerously left off the tee that quite honestly, I mean, it takes a couple of hops off of, off of the cart path could have easily gone left into the hazard. He could easily be hitting his third from up there, uh, gets a favorable bounce, gets to take relief from the cart path and then just hits an absolute seed uh, to let me, I want to get this right to three feet and taps it in essentially for Eagle. Like that could have, that could have been, a bogey it could have been worse it turns into an eagle like that was inches to keep him in the contention of this thing you're you're absolutely right um and and it's amazing the kind of breaks that you get and it's funny it kind of came back to him on 17 the putt you say you hit on 17 it looks like it has to go in yeah and it just dives off at the end and um and, and you wonder if that's just kind of the the game balancing itself out um, but that putt was it was exactly five feet four inches. But when you Rick look at um, at Harry Higgs, I mean, were you pulling for him? Do you feel like Stuart Sink in his last two wins is just a, is a heartbreaker? Are the fans pulling for Harry Higgs? You think the fans are definitely pulling for Harry Higgs? Um, I have to admit, I, I'm kind of lukewarm on him. Like I, I sometimes I think it's like really cool. Sometimes I'm like, all right, this is a little much. Like I, I don't know. I, I I like him, don't love him. I don't know anything about him other than the shtick that we see. But I know that the fan base is very large for Harry Higgs. They like the deep V. They like the way that he just goes out there and lets it fly. Like there's a lot of things to like about him. But no, I was pulling for Stuart Singh. I, I like the. I really liked the story of Singh having his son on the bag, his wife being there. It's 11 years since. I thought that was a really cool story. I was I was completely cool with seeing sync win this thing i was really surprised to see that it was it was 11 years ago it yeah. really surprised me so i'm with you i i like the guy so much um and i love watching that golf swing and i felt like there was a point last year where i felt like Stuart sink was starting to play some really good golf and then it kind of fell off again and it's been a little bit um you know it, it hasn't been stellar it hasn't been a guy that you're saying like i, I don't know when you watch a tournament like this, do you look back afterwards and say, did I miss something here in my pre-tournament analysis? Should I have, should I have picked Stuart Sink to win this week? Because for me, I look at him and I say, well, it's a great story. But there's no way I could have picked him to to win this week. Not weeks like this. I mean, I mean, we like PGA Championship, I feel like was the last time I was like, did we just miss Morikawa? Like, did we just... 
did we just whiff on that? I mean, like, or me personally, where we know he's going to pound a bunch of fairways. We know he's going to hit his irons beautifully. Like that's, that's a situation. We literally said this week, 80 guys can win this golf tournament. Stewart Singh certainly falls within that. We knew it was wide open. I'm not kicking anybody, especially myself for, for not getting Stewart Singh, a guy who was, hasn't a one, hasn't won in 11 years, not on our, on our cards. Yeah. It's a, it's a very fair point. The guy I was rooting for, and I guess I was rooting for a collapse uh, from everybody else, is Doc Redman, friend of the pod, who goes out and fires a 62 and post, post the clubhouse lead essentially before the final group even got started. So we knew this was unlikely to hold at 18 under. Uh, but this is the kind of stuff that, that Doc can do with his ball striking ability. We're seeing his game mature more and more. And if you needed you know, an exclamation point on a 10 under round that matched the lowest round of the week, he finished with six straight birdies, Greg, <laughs> which is like the guy who's like, let me play nine more. I might like, how, how, how deep can I go here? Yeah, that's, uh, he's not afraid of holding his breath. That's what he said. I mean, yeah. to, to make six birdies in a row is there's something that comes over you. It, it's hard to stay in the moment and just play the next shot and play the next shot. I know you have two par fives in there and there are definitely birdie opportunities, um, which he clearly took advantage of. But it's hard to take advantage of all of those in a row, when, especially when you feel like you got a chance at winning. How, Like you said, how low can you go? Um, but the the ball striking today was ridiculous. The iron play was ridiculous he led the field in proximity today and strokes gained approach which uh, it, it's not too hard to figure that out but he had 17 of 18 greens his proximity was 16 feet four inches for the, for the whole <laughs> round so it's, i mean give yourself give yourself 18 putts from 16 feet how many are you going to make it, there's a good chance you're going to make a few he hit his approach on 13 to 11 feet he hit his approach on 14 to 8 he hit his T shot, which is a par three, 15 to 11 inches. Uh, he birdied the par five, 16. His approach on 17 was three feet, three inches. And then he birdied 18, the par five coming in. Like, yeah, dialed, absolutely dialed. Dialed. It's one of those, you wish this didn't happen on Sunday. Well, that's actually kind of, it kind of goes both ways. I'd love to get your thoughts on this. If you're Doc Redmond, do you wish this happened on Saturday or Sunday? Oh. <sighs> Man, good question. We'll have to have him on. We'll have to ask him. I, I yeah. it, you know, in, in the world of they all count, right? They all count for, for yeah. this week. Uh, I do wonder if he is just licking his chops thinking, oh, get, get me to winged foot, right? Like, let me, let, me see, let me see if I can continue this at a major championship. I, I, I don't know. It would be a really good question. For this week, obviously, it doesn't matter, but there might be bigger things ahead for, uh, for Mr. Redmond. I have a funny feeling um... – the experience of hunting flags next week is going to be a little different than it was this week. <laughs> you don't think there's six straight birdies on the card next week? <laughs> well, uh, it, well, I guess we'll see, but no, there, no. there's no way. I mean, you, it's just the, we'll see what happens with the greens. If the greens get soft, you can make, you can make six birdies in a row. Very unlikely, but you could, if the greens are soft, but I don't think they will be. I don't, I don't think so either. Uh, the, the aforementioned Ches Reavy, the other guy, 11 years between wins. Oh, by the way, finds himself on the first page of the leaderboard, finishes in a tie for third with two rounds of 66 on the weekend. And he came in in quite a flurry, Greg. He comes in in 29 to shoot that 66 on Sunday. He's not really you know we we kind of look ahead to the u.s open right we kind of look ahead to winged foot and he's not the prototypical guy that finds success at difficult golf courses because he's not very long off the tee but with the emphasis on finding the fairway really has had a good run at u.s opens in the last three years now he's playing well i mean it's kind of interesting what's brewing here it is interesting he's becoming a, a player you can really count on. He, he's becoming much more consistent as a player and, and his driving accuracy is it's really impressive. And when he gets, this is the funny thing about a Ches Reavy, And this is what most people don't understand about tour players. You think of a guy who's not that long off the tee, a guy who's going to hit fairways, plot his way around. You, you think they aren't going to make a lot of birdies. You think they aren't going to um, have the ability to go low to use fantasy 
fantasy football terms. You've been hearing these all, all day. Um, well, what's his floor? What's his ceiling? And you think of a Ches Revius having maybe a pretty high floor, but, a, but not a very high ceiling. And he shows you today making seven birdies on the back nine that, that he can, he can flirt. He can make a ton of birdies. He makes them in bunches. What I find so interesting is he said last year with his, uh, with, with his win um, at the travelers, he said he actually got more conservative and, and playing more conservative allowed him to, in a strange way to shoot lower scores, but he was still able to make a lot of birdies. So I found it interesting. I guess today there was a lot of a lot of opportunity for him to go. He was six in proximity today, uh, hitting fifteen of eighteen greens. But the the guy is very underrated, in my opinion. For sure, um, I do want to make a quick correction. Doc Redman not in the U.S. Open field next week, so he's definitely not going to be making six birdies in a row or six birdies at all. So we'll wait and see where he tees it up next. Man, uh, I well, I, I wouldn't I wouldn't try to play a money game with him. Um, <laughs> I'm busy, Doc. <laughs> I'm busy, yeah. Uh, yeah. Shout out to Akshay Batia. We talked about him on Saturday evening's pod after round three. He makes a birdie on 18 uh, to get himself into the top 10, which is going to get him into Corrales Punta Cana. And he knew it, Greg, right? He gave it, he gave it a, a fist pump on 18 when he made that putt. I think he knew that was a big one. Yeah, you you love to see it. A couple of things with Akshay. I mean, you're talking about your this is your first cut that you've made on the PGA Tour, and yeah. now you're you're contending for a top ten. Even if it doesn't get you into the next event, it, it gives you confidence. Okay, if you're Akshay, hey, I I can play out here. I can do this. People have been, uh, I would say, very critical of Akshay and the route that he's gone, choosing not to go to college for for at least a year. Um, he's definitely taken some heat for it and you'd love to see him kind of prove everybody wrong. And look, it's not a win. And this doesn't mean that he, it doesn't mean that it's the right or the wrong decision by any means. But if you're Akshay in your own head, you're saying, yeah, I was right. I knew it. And and now I just showed it. And now next week uh, or in the next tournament, I'm going to go out and do the exact same thing again. And that Punta Cana event uh, this year, and I don't know what its status is moving forward. That's a regular tour event. That is not no longer yeah. an alternate field event, right? So, I mean, this is even, I don't know what kind of field it's going to attract, but uh, big, this is, again, this is a very important, that's going to be a very important start for him. Just off the top of my head, I, I think they made this a, a, a full FedEx Cup point stop before all this happened, before the schedule change. I could, mm. I could have it mixed up with a, a different opposite field event, but I'm pretty sure... This one um, entered pre-COVID was was going to be a uh, a regular stop. So interesting to see, but yeah, important. Important indeed. Uh, let's take a peek ahead to the U.S. Open because we did get a little bit of breaking news on Sunday, and unfortunately, what what we find out, Scotty Scheffler has withdrawn. He tested positive for COVID nineteen. He is out for the U S open, uh, which is not only unfortunate because the tour was on a really good run of no positive tests, but it's also really, really unfortunate for Scotty who has been playing so well, Greg, he was trending in the right direction. He contended at the PGA championship. He played great at the tour championship. He was probably so stoked to get to, to get to wings foot and be able to compete. And it's not going to happen. It it's extremely disappointing. Um, I feel so bad for him because yeah. you're right. We've been on this great run and this was something that everybody kind of hypothesized about before we, b before we return to golf. Well, what's going to happen when a big star has to miss an event, when somebody has to withdraw, when we, we had all these hypotheticals going on and none of them happened. No, I mean, not, we, we got through this scot free. No, nothing happened. I mean, you had Brooks choosing to withdraw from an event because his caddy got it, and it happened to Webb too. Um, but but they came back right away and played great, and we we kind of like got away with it. And now, unfortunately for Scotty, he's going to have to miss it. So I feel really bad for him. Um, but still, it, it's amazing that this is the first positive ten test in a, a long time. I mean, it, it is, it's almost like you, you could forget about it if all you did was follow the PGA Tour. Yeah, that's true. I wonder if this will be kind of, I, I don't want to call it a wake-up call. The tour has been, I mean, knock on wood, 
has been excellent in this in this restart. I think better than any of us could have even imagined this has gone. But you wonder if if uh, it sends not not shockwaves, but just a little bit of oh, okay, this is still something we've got to be uh, very careful about. We want to make sure that we can contend and compete in these events. Uh, Brandon Grace is actually going to replace him, so so that spot is going to be filled. Brandon Grace will take Scotty Scheffler's spot, uh, and I don't know if this is a full circle thing, but in 2020, I mean, Grace was the the previous player to the last player to test positive for COVID. It was six weeks ago. Well, my hope is that uh, it is a full circle and this closes the circle. So, I go. mean, that, that's all that I can hope for. Um, but we'll see. I mean, look, Scotty's going to have a lot of U.S. Opens to contend in. You don't know how many of them are going to be at wing foot, which is why I, I really I, I feel for him. Um, but but he's going to be fine. He's He's going to have a lot of opportunities. A little international news. Tommy Fleetwood, who's been known to make a little bit of noise at the U.S. Open, finishes T3 at the Portugal Masters, and our buddy Justin Ray had a really great stat that uh, has me drooling a little bit, Greg. Uh, Tommy Fleetwood gained 17.7 strokes from T to green in that event, which was 5.7 more than anyone else. I... I understand it's a Euro field event. I am trying not to get too hot and bothered by this, but with Tommy Fleetwood's uh, ball striking prowess that we know and his history at U.S. Opens, you've got to start considering him as a viable option for next week. I wouldn't sleep on him. I mean, look, th th that means uh, it, it means he's confident, if nothing else. You can you can look at that number any way you want. Yeah, it's a weak field, blah, blah, blah. It, it doesn't matter. What that does say is he's hitting it really well. And when Tommy Fleetwood gets on difficult golf courses, I think to uh, Par Le Golf National at Paris, and he was dominant because of long and straight drives. And, and he continues to do that. And when you get to more difficult golf courses, it tends to suit Tommy Fleetwood's game even better because it rewards uh, it, it rewards length and precision and he has both and and he has both um you know he's he's not lacking by any means so he's definitely someone you don't want to sleep on if you've got a little hanker in for tommy fleetwood he is 30 to 1 via our friends at william hill at the moment greg i want to talk a little bit about the ana inspiration and we've got to go through our odds and ends which includes our matchup challenge and our one and done but first we're going to take a quick break and hear a word from our partners I found myself uh, tuning in to the ANA inspiration, Greg, because I knew things were heating up and things were getting interesting on Twitter. And I flip over to see what the ladies are up to. And, you know, the, the headline, Miram Lee goes out and wins the ANA inspiration. She chipped in three times in her final round and twice over the last three holes. That's pretty timely, Greg. If you're ever going to do it, uh, I would recommend it in a, in a big time event. <laughs> If you haven't spent a lot of time watching the LPGA tour, I, I mean, try to find some time to do it um, because they are immensely talented. And, and I've had a chance to spend a little time with a number of the players out there. And they're they're so good, especially around the greens. It's it's not it's not surprising to hear about those chip ins because I've seen it in practice from many LPGA tour players. So uh, very impressive. But to do that is is to chip in twice in the what is it the final three holes of yeah. a major championship to chip in three times uh, in the final round of a major championship and go on to win hey i don't know if i if i can recall somebody else doing that in in the men's or women's game so uh amazing performance and, and clutch she chipped in for Eagle on 18 to get into a playoff with Brooke Henderson and Nellie Corda, but the, the 18th hole created a bit more controversy than I think uh, we would have liked to have seen in a major championship because the, I guess it was the 72nd hole in regulation, Brooke Henderson uh, smashes what? A three wood, a five wood, essentially through the green and into this blue wall i don't know how else to describe it greg it was essentially constructed to mimic the grandstands in other years where there would normally be fans this is where they would sit uh although with no fans this year uh they have opted to construct and erect this blue wall Brooke Henderson's ball gets kind of stuck underneath of it. It was really awkward. They were kind of looking for it and her caddy's on the ground trying to find it underneath there, peeking underneath the tarp. Uh, long story short, she, you know, gets relief. She gets up and down and gets into a playoff. But of course the Twitter sphere did not like the idea that this blue wall even existed in a year with 
no fans. Yeah, it, it's definitely an interesting scenario. Um, and I'm sure they have their reasons for it. And I'm, I'm okay. With, I, look, I, I trust Mike Juan, everything he does, setting up golf courses. I, I think that um, that he does a great job. So I'm not sure what the purpose was. It definitely creates an interesting scenario and it leaves you wondering why it's there. Um, so whatever the reasons are, I'm sure they're, they're good, but it definitely created an interesting scenario. Um, I, but I, I'm a big um, Brooke Henderson fan. So her, her caddy, her sister, Brittany, um, I actually went to school with her mm. and she was in our PGM program at coastal and she can play too. Let me tell you, she, she whipped up on all of us. Um, just about every time she teed it up. So I was definitely interested in what Brooke was going to do. I was hoping she was going to pull it out. Um, but, but difficult down the stretch. What would you make of the blue wall? I, this is one of those situations where I probably understand why they did it, where they probably sat down and there was probably a meeting about this. And they said, let's, let's have this event play as if it were a normal year. And in a normal year, there would be grandstands there. Let's mimic it. Let's not change it. You know, these, these golfers have played here before. Um, but my issue is it's not a normal year. There, there's, there's really no reason for it. And I don't blame anybody who wants to kind of use it as a backstop. It's there for you. Like if it's going to be part of the course, go ahead, use it. If that's part of your game plan, unfortunately, it just like, it makes that shot so much different, right? It just changes the way that you play that shot with a giant blue wall behind the green. And I don't know, like I get why it was there. I don't think it was a good idea. You know, sometimes with the blue wall, it, when, it's easy infam- when you watch TV. This blue wall. <laughs> yeah. It's easy when you watch TV sometimes to think, oh, well, you just hit uh, a three wood instead of a five wood and blast yeah. it long of the green. And it makes it feel like you're playing uh, 2K21 and you just click what R1 and bump up a club and just, and a, just, just hit, add oh, some clubs. Just to hit it, a three. Right? Yeah. Just hit one more club. But you're talking about it, a three wood on the 72nd hole of a major to the green, there's, there's a lot of room for error um, and there's water short and everything. And so I understand where you're coming from, but I don't think it, I, I don't think it makes it that much easier. Like there was, um, I, there's this, a kid I went to college with too. Uh, so he made a comment that I can't believe he said to this day. And he said, guys, all you have to do is get to the PGA tour. And once you get there, it's so much easier. You've got fans lining the fairways. You've got grandstands you can hit it into. You can't lose a ball out there. I mean, it, it's so much easier to go low once you get to the PGA Tour. And you just can't believe that he said that because now you're talking about you're talking about the misses. Well, oh, it, it's easier because when you miss, it doesn't get as bad. But you still got to go shoot significantly under par. They're, right? They're, they're missing maybe once, maybe twice in a round. So... Uh, the course is the same for everybody. I understand it. I, I don't think it's that big of an advantage. Uh, and I don't think it changes the whole too much. So I, look, I, I give it a pass. I don't make as big a deal of it as everybody else. I just think it's always a shame. We can, we can move on. It's like, of course it comes into play on the 72nd hole, right? Like, right. like we, why, like, why do we have to be talking about it? Like, of course it does. That can that thing could have sat there for three months and no one, it never ran into the situation again. Of course it happens on the 72nd hole, which is only unfortunate. So just, I think it's just bad luck. Yeah. I, I understand where you're coming from. Matchup challenge. Kyle Porter, who thankfully is not here to continue his victory lap, uh, continues to be scorching hot. Uh, he is six. He went six zero oh, and two in matchup bets this week. Although we were all pretty good, you and I, Greg, we were both four two and two. That'll get the job done every single week. Mark was three three and two. So I mean, we're, we're these are all just fine and dandy. Um, what are we going to do about Kyle? He is he is whipping our butts in matchups right now. I don't know. I, I don't, or maybe, um, I, I, I think Jacob might have to change a couple of numbers or something. We gotta, we gotta fudge some numbers. Cause he's well, scorching six Oh and two has, is that the first week somebody has gone without a loss? I think it has to be. I, I, th- I think it is. I mean, maybe, uh, Jacob can take a look at that a little later, but 
um, yeah, it's impressive. So I, I tip my cap to him. I don't think we have to take him out at the knees. We'll let this, it's a, it's a long season. We'll see how it plays out. Shout out KP who keeps his hot run going and then one and done. Uh, so I've got good news. Uh, all of us made the cut. We got a little bit of money, although nobody, and also I me, mean, I don't know if this is good news or bad news. I guess it's good news for all of us. Nobody's going to win all that much. So, uh, I've got you, Greg, I've got Mark and I've got producer Jacob all with a T29. You and Mark both took Brendan Steele. Producer Jacob took HV3, who, oh, by the way, had a great Sunday final round. Made you, yeah. made you a couple, I don't know, 10,000 bucks extra. But what T29, that's going to get you, I don't know, 50, 50 grand, something like that. You're not going to break the bank with a, with a T29. No, no, you're not. So we're basically, uh, this being the first year of a super season, we got 50, we have, what, 49 more tournaments? Yeah. Uh, I don't know if we'll, we'll be playing one and done in all of them, but there's a lot of golf left to be played, and we're all pretty much still, I call this still an even playing field. Uh, yeah, we're basically all at zero by the by the point. Uh, KP had Siwoo, who also had a very nice Sunday. Actually, that was one of the most disappointing things because Siwoo had some of the best rounds of the week. He shot a 65 on Friday, a 66 on Sunday, and that's 77 on Saturday. Just like we talked about it last night, just played himself out of this thing. That was that's that's pretty disappointing. He ends up in a T44. Yeah, that that's why Siwoo as a as a favorite is not really a great bet, right? He is, he's a, he's a great long shot because he can, he can pop up and have really hot weeks and he can be that, uh, that stock price. That's way, it's really volatile. And if you hit it at the right time, there's a huge reward. Um, but, but for him to be in the favorite role, I think is a tough one for him because of the volatility. And then I had Joel Damon T52. So same thing. One of the, uh, shorter odds coming in, not getting it done. He just, he just, didn't do much all week. I mean, rounds of 71, 68, 71, 70. That's not, that's not what we need. No, but you know what? Do, do you think there's anybody here that you look at and say, man, uh, there's going to be a week later on where I really wish I could play him. No. <laughs> so this is almost, <laughs> I, I'm looking at this. I'm saying, okay, no harm, no foul. Maybe, maybe Jacob with HV three, I guess you could see HV three getting really hot at some point during the year, but I mean, he's probably not like the, oh, I, I got to have him. So I'm, I'm not sure any of these guys will be missed. No, I, I call this one no harm, no foul. T29 got you $41,391, which is a good week, but not in our one and done pool. So we're basically all at zero heading into week two. And Greg, we finished the Safeway Open recap. So you know what we're, what we're on to now. Oh, yeah. It's a major it's championship here. week. Yeah. It's here. Again, you, it's September. It's September. Oh, here's a fun little fact. I don't have it in front of me, but I read that 90%, estimated 90% of the work done at Winged Foot next week will be done in the dark because of shorter days in September and how little daylight they will have as opposed to playing this in the middle of the summer. Steve Rabidou and his, uh, and his team and the USGA's team uh, they're going to be up at four. They're going to be getting going at like four o'clock, which is a real challenge because there's a lot of guys. There's Steve Rabidou, who's the um, the superintendent over there. His official term is uh, his official title rather is director of golf courses, and and his team they know how to get around the, the property. They know where they're going. They can do it in the dark. They can operate in the dark. But you have a lot of volunteers. You have a lot of USGA help out there. It, it's a significantly larger team that'll be preparing the golf course every day. So it will be a real challenge. And when you're watching the golf course, you're looking at, at all the beauty. You got to understand the amount of time, the hours that, that these, uh, that, that these guys are putting in. Cause it is not just this week, but all year it has been extreme and, um, and they've done a great job with it from everything I've heard. Strap on those headlamps. You're going to need them this week at Winged Foot. Greg, thank you very much for joining me. We are going to fast forward to the U.S. Open to a major championship week. We've got a ton of great stuff coming at you all week long. You can find Greg on Twitter at TheRealGFD. You can find me on Twitter at Rick Run Good. This has been The First Cut, and we'll catch you next time.